Yeah, and all God's people said, amen. amen. Well, good morning, Trinity Church family, and a special welcome to those of you uh, who might be joining us for the first time as we are continuing our study of the book of Romans, looking today uh, at the necessity of the gospel, the necessity of the gospel. One of the things to understand about the book of Romans uh, is that Paul writes this letter uh, sort of like he's building a case, like a lawyer would, like an attorney would, as to why each of us needs the gospel. Uh, in fact, during the first 100 years of Harvard Law School, one of the assignments that was given to first-year law students was to analyze this letter to the church at Rome uh, as an example of how to carefully build a case, uh, which is what Paul begins to do in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. If you have your Bible and you want to turn there, Romans 1, verses 16 and 17 uh, is like Paul's opening statement, if you will. Uh, here it is, beginning in verse 16 of chapter 1. Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. First to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. As I said, this is Paul's opening statement uh, in his case where he declares that the gospel, which as I've explained to you, the gospel is who Jesus is, what Jesus has done for us. Uh, Paul is declaring how the gospel is the power of God to save everyone who believes. That in the gospel, God's righteousness is given to us by faith. Now I say a bunch of those words, and some of you would be, uh, be fair to ask the question, why do I even need to be saved? Right? Like, why, why do I even need God's righteousness? You're using these words, salvation, righteousness. Why do I even need to be saved? Why do I even need God's righteousness? Is Paul saying, I'm lost? Is Paul saying, I'm unrighteous? Is Paul saying that I'm spiritually sick? Uh, well, the short answer is yes. Uh, Paul is saying that we're lost. Paul is saying that we are unrighteous. Paul is saying that we are spiritually sick. And Paul knows that unless he can convince us that we're sick, there's no point in trying to get us to go to the doctor. Because only those who recognize their sin will see their need for a Savior. Uh, by the way, this is the reason that Jesus says to the Pharisees, who thought they were already righteous, remember what Jesus says to them? He says, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but what? Sinners. And in saying that, Jesus didn't mean that some people are righteous and other people are sinners. Well, no, what Jesus was saying is that he, the doctor, had come to bring healing and forgiveness to everyone, but only those willing to admit they're sick would receive his healing and his forgiveness. That's, that's the point that Jesus is trying to make. He's the doctor. We're all sick, but only those who acknowledge their sickness will experience healing. How many of you, uh, let me just ask it this way, how many of you sometimes have a hard time admitting that you're sick and need a doctor? Any fellow guys in the room? Yeah, you don't, the guys are like, I don't even, I'm not even going to admit that. Uh, five years ago, uh, upon returning from a mission trip to India, I was as sick as I have ever been. I, I couldn't even get out of bed. Uh, my fever was so high that I started to hallucinate. Uh, but like some of you guys out there, uh, when Amanda said, you need to go see a doctor, I said, no, I think I'm okay. <laughs> and Amanda, those of you who know Amanda, uh, you know she's very typically soft-spoken, uh, but she knew that I wasn't in my right mind, and so she appropriately pushed back saying, uh, don't you think the fact that you're hallucinating might be a sign that you're sick? <laughs> now, uh, was Amanda hating on me by saying that I was sick? No. She, all the women are like, no. No. Um, no, she was loving me. She, she was loving me enough to tell me the truth about how sick I was so that I would then see my need to go see a doctor. And of course, like usual, she was right. <laughs> and, and after I went to the doctor and I, they ran some tests and they diagnosed my sickness and they gave me some powerful meds. And in a couple of days, I was feeling great again. My, my point in telling that story though is this. Uh, the turning point in my healing was Amanda helping me see that I was sick. Well, that's what Paul is going to do in this next section of Romans. He's going to help us see that we are spiritually sick so that we recognize our need for the gospel. So that's why there's going to be some strong words here. What, what you've got to understand, though, is that, that Paul is trying to help us recognize 
our spiritual sickness so that we see our need for a Savior. So beginning in verse 18, here's how he begins. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people. Right out of the gate. He's made his opening statement, verses 16 and 17, and now he's going to build his case. And right out of the gate, Paul wants to make it clear that the reason that we all need the gospel and the gift of God's righteousness is because without it, we are all under God's wrath. We are all under God's judgment. Now, a lot of people today, and maybe even some of you who are here this morning, would say, wow, God's wrath, that seems a little harsh. I'm not that bad. I'm not so bad that I deserve God's wrath. Besides, I thought that God was love. Doesn't God's love mean that God's not going to judge me? A loving God wouldn't judge people, would he? Well, Paul and the rest of the Bible, by the way, would beg to differ. See, God is love. Let me be really clear. Let me say that again. God is love, but God is also holy. And since God is holy, since God is just, he cannot and will not wink at sin like it's no big deal. God is just. He's perfectly just. And so he will judge everything that is unrighteous which means he will also judge us because every one of us is unrighteous. Because every one of us has rejected his rule and gone our own way, in one way or another. Which is then why we all now need something to save us from God's judgment. We all now need something to save us from God's wrath. Now, I know that God's wrath is not a very popular doctrine these days, and I I get it, this word wrath itself Uh, for some of us, seems morally beneath the character of a loving God. Like on the list of attributes, on the list of ways that you would describe God, wrath doesn't make the Mount Rushmore. It might not even make the top ten. It might not even make your list. And so you're thinking, wrath, that, that just seems so morally beneath the character of a loving God. And I think it's in part because when most of us think of this word wrath, we think of someone flying off the handle. We think of someone who's out of control, someone who's maybe acting out of their wounded pride. But folks, you've got to understand this next couple of minutes. This is so important for you to understand the rest, really, of the book of Romans. That's not at all the way that the Bible describes God's wrath. Uh, J.I. Packer uh, gives a great definition of God's wrath. You might want to just write this down or maybe take a picture. Uh, J.I. Packer says this, God's wrath is never the capricious, self-indulgent, irritable thing that human anger so often is. It is instead, and here we go, it is instead a right and necessary reaction to moral evil. Every one of those words in that last sentence is so important. It is a right and necessary reaction to moral evil. In other words, God's wrath is God's perfect, just judgment of all that is wrong in the world. Or as Paul says in verse 18, the wrath of God is being revealed against all godlessness and wickedness. Now, those two words, godlessness, wickedness, these are also terms that we usually reserve uh, for the really bad people of society, right? Like serial killers, sex traffickers. But these are also words that get used in the Bible to describe us, all of us, actually. Uh, Let me explain. This word uh, godlessness, this is a reference to our disregard for God's rule. This is the vertical relationship that is out of sync. God's got a rule. We want to disregard that rule. We want to decide what is right. We want to decide what is good. We don't want to submit to God's word. We have our own idea of what is good. We have our own idea of what is right. We have our own idea of what will make me happy or whole. And we've all done this in different ways where we decide to go our own way instead of God's way. That's godlessness. And then there's the second word, wickedness, which is literally the word injustice. This is the horizontal dimension of a relationship gone awry. This is a reference to our sin against each other. This is where we have failed to love our neighbor. This is where we have failed to uphold uphold truth and justice in our society. And again, on this point, we've all failed. Right? There isn't one of us in this room, including the one who's wearing the microphone, who has perfectly loved our neighbor or upheld truth and justice in society. Which, by the way, is the reason that God's creation is a mess and God's wrath is upon us. Because remember, God's wrath is his settled, 
response, his settled response against all godlessness and wickedness. This is God acting against, responding to, judging all that is wrong in the world. Now, here's the thing that you need to hear, because this is going to sound a little bit like disequilibrium, so I'm going to kind of set it up by, by saying you're not going to think this is, this is real at first, but, but, but try to follow along here with me. God's wrath against all that is wrong in the world is actually evidence of God's love for the world. It's actually evidence of God's love for the world. N.T. Wright says it this way. He says, God cares passionately about this world. And if there are activities which damage and destroy his world and his human beings, God will not let that go on forever. Hallelujah. He says, God is justly angry about them. If he were not angry about them, he says, he wouldn't be a good God. So so God's wrath against all that is wrong in the world is actually evidence of God's love for the world. So you've got to understand wrath in that way. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people. Paul here begins his case for our need of the gospel by declaring how we are all under God's wrath. Boy, this is not the way that most pastors begin their explanation of the gospel, is it? Uh, Today, I I rarely hear pastors talk at all about God's wrath, uh, much less do I hear them beginning their explanation of the gospel with how we're all under God's wrath. Uh, Most pastors, we just prefer to talk about God's love. And I think it's because we don't want to sound like that fire and brimstone street preacher yelling at people, portraying God as this vengeful, vindictive deity who's out to get you, which I get that. I don't want to sound like that guy. You know, I don't want to be up here having you think of me in those terms, so I get this. But here's the problem. In the process of pastors neglecting to teach about God's wrath, we now have an entire generation that doesn't really understand God's holiness. We have an entire generation that doesn't really understand God's judgment of sin. And therefore, an entire generation that doesn't really see their need for the gospel. After all, if God already loves me, and I, and I take that to mean that God's not going to judge me, then why do I even need Jesus? I mean, that's kind of how the logic works. In fact, it's this failure on the part of pastors to teach about God's wrath uh, that inspired this satire article entitled, Woman Unsure Why She Needs Jesus, After Preacher Spends 30 Minutes Telling Her How Amazing She Is. Uh, here's the article. According to Hope Community Church, by the way, this is a not, not a real article, According to Hope Community Church, first-time visitor Brittany Wilson remains unsure about why she needs this Jesus guy in her life after the pastor spent the entire sermon speaking of how awesome, amazing, unique, and special she is. The message was super encouraging, she said. It was all about how I need to let the goodness within me shine and just do me, without worrying about all the haters, she said after the service. But then the pastor said I needed Jesus, out of the blue. Like, what? It made no sense. I'm not sure what Jesus has to offer that I don't already have based on how wonderful the pastor said I am. Brittany also reported that she was, quote, a little hurt that the pastor would segue into an invitation to add Jesus to her life. It really undermined my confidence in myself, she said, adding that she wouldn't be back anytime soon. I mean, it's kind of a tongue-in-cheek article, uh, but but I share it because, uh, sadly, this evangelistic approach describes what is happening in many churches today, where pastors are pandering to people's pride, telling them how awesome we are, telling them how awesome you are, and and not calling out our sin. And then somewhere along the way, trying to sneak in this invitation to receive Jesus as Savior. On the other hand, Paul, very different approach. Paul begins his explanation of the gospel by telling us that God's wrath against sin is upon us so that we understand that we're sinners in need of a savior. In other words, Paul presents the gospel as a necessity because the wrath of God is our default reality. But until I understand that, until I understand the reality of God's wrath, which by the way is a word that's mentioned more times in the Bible than God's love, until I understand the reality of God's wrath, the gospel just won't seem relevant to me. Because I won't see its necessity. Which is why a whole bunch of people in the culture are like, well, that works for you. Like if you're sentimental, if you've got some religious sensitivities and proclivities, like I'm glad that works for you. It seems absolutely irrelevant to most of the culture. 
Why would I need that? Well, if you don't have an understanding that God's wrath against sin is our default reality, why would you? Well, this is why in the rest of verse 18, uh, he's going to explain this in greater detail. Now, here's the thing you've got to understand as we're walking through this letter. Paul is always anticipating questions. Uh, and one of the questions he's going to anticipate at this point is that some folks who are reading this are going to think, this, this just doesn't seem fair. God's wrath doesn't seem fair. Because what about the folks who have, for example, never read the Bible, they've never heard the Bible, and therefore they don't know any better? Like, that, that God's wrath for them too, that doesn't seem fair. Well, this is why uh, Paul's going to say in this next part of verse 18 that everyone knows better. That all of us have enough knowledge of God. All of us have enough knowledge of right and wrong that we know that we are morally accountable to this God and that we haven't kept the standard. In fact, Paul says that the problem isn't that we don't have enough knowledge of God. Paul says the problem is that we suppress that knowledge. Look at the rest of verse 18 and 19. He says, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. Paul's point here is that even if we've never read the Bible, creation itself points us to the truth that there is this God of immense power to whom you and I owe our allegiance. And yet Paul says we suppress that truth. We suppress that truth. Now why would we do that? Why would we suppress that truth? Well, we suppress that truth so that we can live our lives however we want, doing whatever we want, right? See, just like the first sin of the first human beings, you and I want to be God. Now we would never say it so crassly because that seems like above our pay grade. But that's what we want. We want to determine for ourselves what is good. We want to determine for ourselves what is right. We want to determine for ourselves what will make us happy and whole. And so we will suppress that knowledge of God in order to maintain our autonomy. And all of us at some point in some way, we've done this. We've we've suppressed truth about God and his ways so that we can do what we want. It's interesting, Paul uses this word suppress very intentionally. Uh, because, of course, suppression of truth is not the same, of, same as ignorance of truth, is it? Uh, suppression means the truth is there, but, but we're trying to push it down. Uh, and the image that comes to mind is that of a beach ball that we're trying to keep under the water. I don't know if you've ever tried to do this, but like the beach ball, it, just, it has this tendency to keep coming to the surface, right? Even while we're trying to push it down. It, it has this way of finding a way through the water. Tim Keller says that what Paul is saying here is that when it comes to the knowledge of God, we know, but sometimes we don't know because we don't want to know. We know, but sometimes we don't know because we don't want to know. Here's the illustration that he uses to explain this. He says, near the end of World War II, the first town with a concentration camp that the Allied forces liberated was the town of Ordruf, Germany. He says, the Nazis tried to get rid of any evidence of the camp, but the Allies got there before they could do this. American GIs witnessed hundreds of dead bodies. It was the first concentration camp they had witnessed. A few hours later, General Patton arrived and promptly vomited upon witnessing the scene. The next day, Patton brought the mayor of Ordruf and his wife to see for themselves what they had to have known was happening in their town. He ordered the mayor and every other able body in the town to dig graves for each dead body. After they dug the graves and conducted a funeral for the deceased, Patton found out that the mayor and his wife hung themselves. Before their death, they left a note that read, We didn't know, but we knew. We didn't know, but we knew. Paul's point here in verse 19 is that all of us know there is a God to whom we are accountable. We might not understand. There might be, of course, still mystery. But but Paul says we have this understanding. We know that there's a God to whom we're accountable. And some of us tell ourselves that we don't know because we don't want to know. Friends, even if we've never read the Bible, creation itself tells us that there is a God. That's Paul's point in verse 20. He says, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. That's the key phrase in that verse, so that people are without excuse. J.D. Greer notes that philosophers and scientists have been making this 
case, this argument for centuries, pointing out that the universe itself argues for the reality of God. For example, Aristotle, who lived 350 years or so before Christ, he was the philosophical father of what's known today as the cosmological argument for the existence of God, which basically poses the rhetorical question, why is there something rather than nothing? And where did that something come from? Now, I don't want to get into a debate about young earth versus old earth, but just for the sake of argument, let's just say the earth is 14 billion years old and began with a big bang. The question still remains, where did the cosmic stuff that caused the big bang come from and who pulled the trigger? See, nothingness does not produce somethingness. It's a very simple argument. Uh, There's also what philosophers call the teleological argument for the existence of God, teleos, uh, is a Greek word that means purpose, the end, the objective. The teleological argument for the existence of God basically focuses on how our universe is finely tuned. Finely tuned specifically for the purpose of life. As if it points to a designer who designed it that way. Uh, sometimes scientists refer to this as the Goldilocks principle. If you're familiar with Goldilocks and the Three Bears, you remember that story? Goldilocks enters the house of the Three Bears and everything she tries that belongs to Papa Bear doesn't quite fit her. Everything she tries that belongs to Mama Bear doesn't quite fit her either. But everything that she tries that belongs to Baby Bear is just right. Yeah, you know the story, just right. Well, the more that scientists figure out what is required for intelligent life, the more they're discovering that everything in our little corner of the universe is just right for life. For example, if the percentage of CO2 in our atmosphere was just a little higher or lower, even one one one-hundredth of a percent, the, the earth would either become an oven or we'd have no atmosphere. Either way, we would die. Uh, the tilt of the earth is also set to a just right 23.5 degrees, which is exactly what we need for temperatures and tides. Without That just right tilt of 23.5 degrees, our temperatures would be so extreme that we would all die, and our tides would be so out of whack that we would all drown. Our gravity is also just right for life. Our distance from the sun is just right for life. The density of our water molecule is just right for life. In fact, if any of these variables, and there are hundreds of these variables, if any of these variables were off by even the smallest of margins, life on earth would not be possible. Now, I know some people will say, well, in a universe as big as ours, though, a planet that can sustain intelligent life, it's bound to pop up somewhere. I mean, the universe is pretty big, right? After all, the number of planets in the universe is 100 sextillion. Uh, That's a one with 23 zeros, if you're not familiar with how, you know, the sextillion number fits into the into the range. One with 23 zeros. And so the atheist argument is that given that that many planets, right? A a one with 23 zeros. Given, Given that many planets, there's bound to be at least one that can support life without the help of a god. Okay, but uh, do you know what scientists and mathematicians say are the odds for just one of these planets in our universe having all 200 variables be just right to support intelligent life? Well, that, the odds of that are, are 1 in 10 to the 99th. That's a, a 1 with 99 zeros. As I said in the first service, I don't know what that number is. If you can, you know, like send me an email if there's an actual number for 1 with 99 zeros. But that's, those are the odds, okay? <laughs> those are the odds. It would be like, and, and this is what I, uh, I, I got to be clear on this because I'm not a scientist, so I'm a little bit out of my lane, um, I want to be clear. I'm not saying that there could not be life out there somewhere. So so don't don't hear me arguing that. That's not the point. I'm just saying that the odds of intelligent life popping up randomly in our universe are so astronomically low that the idea of it, quote-unquote, just happening defies common sense. And I want to give you an illustration, a a picture of of what these odds are, just so that you can kind of have a a mental image. Uh, It would be like me flipping a coin every second and having it come up heads every time for 10 billion straight years. Are, are you with me? So I, I flip a coin, and if I could do it, I can't even do it every second. It's like, all right, heads, well, there's one. Okay, let's try that again. Um, start over, okay? Um, okay, it's not, not yet. Right? And, and let's just assume that you get to like 9 billion years, and it's like, oh, man, I'm on a run. 
And, and so, right? J.D. Greer says this, that you can speculate that our part of the galaxy was just really, really lucky. But is that the best explanation? He says it actually takes an anti-God bias to arrive there, one that is often motivated by the fact that we don't want to face the moral implications of a God who created us. In other words, we know, but some of us don't know because we don't want to know. We know, but some of us don't know because we don't want to know. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. Paul says everybody in their heart knows the truth. We're just not always willing to admit it. Which, by the way, is the testimony of many of the famous atheists of the 20th century who become Christians, like T.S. Eliot and C.S. Lewis, uh, both of whom admitted what brought them to faith was not some new argument. It was not some new piece of apologetic evidence. Uh, they said they just admitted to themselves what they always knew was true, that there is a God. Right? We know, but some of us don't know because some of us don't want to know. Look at verse 21 as Paul continues this argument. He says, For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. I want you to notice something in these verses. I want you to notice uh, what Paul says happens when we suppress the knowledge of God. He says it's not that we stop worshiping. It's just that we start worshiping something other than God. We stop, there's no way for us to stop worshiping. We just worship something else. Worship uh, being defined as the giving of our lives to whatever we think will make us happy or whole. Whatever we think will satisfy our longings or take away our pain or give us some sense of meaning. It's impossible for us as human beings to not worship. We were made. We have a purpose. We have a teleos to worship. We, we may stop worshiping God, but we will worship something else. That's why Paul says we exchange the glory of God for something else. We, we all do this, and it could be anything. We could exchange the worship of God for any number of things. It could be romance, right? Making the focus of my life, finding that someone who will fulfill me, who will complete me. It could be money, working hard to obtain a little more security or means to comfort. It could be my job, right, where I'm striving for this sense of success, this sense of significance, it could be social media, which is really just a delivery system for trying to get that affirmation that I'm pining for. It could be anything. It could be Notre Dame or Purdue, right? <laughs> Cheering for that deflected glory that comes when my team wins. You just got to know, I didn't do this for the Notre Dame fans. I was committed to saying that before we got to Saturday. But you understand what I'm saying. We've got this deflected glory that we're looking for if our team wins. It could be anything. It could be food. It could be family. It could be friendship. Or it could be sex, which is Paul's example at the end of Romans 1, which we're going to look at next week. Boy, you don't want to miss next week. It will not be boring. You will not fall asleep in church next week. <laughs> now, here's the fair question if you're looking at that golden calf and you're like, yeah, but I'm looking at those things, right, like romance and food, and family, and sex. Like, what's the, what's the problem with these things? Like, I know God created the world, and I also know God said these things are good. Like, aren't these things good? And the answer, for the most part, is yes, these things are good. Although Notre Dame and Purdue fans might argue that point about the other, but generally speaking, these things are good. Here's the problem, though. The problem is that we have this tendency, we have this proclivity, we have this inclination to take a good thing, and then we start treating it like a God thing. And what I mean by treating it like a God thing is that we give ourselves to that thing. We pursue that thing. We sacrifice our lives for that thing in ways that are reserved for God alone. And, and the reality is every single one of us in this room has done that. We have all exchanged the glory of God for things that we think will make us happy. Which is to say we've all pursued created things in unhealthy ways that require us to suppress the truth about God so that we can keep pursuing that created thing that we think will make us happy or whole. By the way, that's the definition of idolatry. It's not you know, just simply worshiping a little statue in a shrine. Idolatry is to give our hearts and our lives and our money and our time over to something other than God that we think will make us happy or whole. And it is for this idolatry 
which always messes us up, always messes up the world. It's for this idolatry that Paul says in verse 18 that God's wrath is upon us. His judgment is upon us because he knows that idolatry wrecks us and wrecks the world. And so his, his wrath is upon us. Now, let me say again, I know it's not very popular these days to talk about God's wrath. Just so you know, folks, uh, you know, God's judgment against sin is not my favorite subject to preach on. But for me to bury in the fine print the truth of our spiritual sickness and need for the gospel, if I were to do that, if I were to bury that in the fine print, if I were to avoid that subject in my preaching, friends, that is worse than if Amanda had allowed me to die in that bed with 105 degree fever because she didn't want to offend me with the truth that I was sick and needed a doctor. Which is why I pray, Lord, forgive me if I ever pull punches in talking about your judgment. Because I think I know better than you do what your people need to hear. God, give me the courage I need to declare what I need to declare. Give me the courage to declare what your word says. Give me the courage to talk about how we have, each one of us, suppressed our knowledge of you for the sake of our idols. So that we see our sickness. Again, it's not just to try to humiliate people. It's so that we see our sickness and understand our need for the gospel so that we will then turn to Jesus. So we'll then turn to Jesus and receive what he did for us on the cross when he took upon himself the wrath, God's wrath, that was due you and me. It's not that God's wrath goes away, folks. It's just that in Christ, it gets redirected to him so that we are now forgiven. We, ex we experience pardon from sin. That's the gospel. That's the gospel that even though you and I are the ones who deserve God's wrath, God in his grace took that wrath upon himself at the cross. Amen? That's why the gospel is called good news. It's also why Paul says in verse 15, I am eager to preach this gospel in Rome. Paul couldn't wait to have another opportunity to preach this good news in another city. In fact, in the capital of the of the Roman Empire. See, if I really understand my spiritual condition before a holy God, and I really understand what Jesus has done to remedy that spiritual condition, that good news, friends, it will compel me to share that good news with other people. I might be stumbling and bumbling along in my witness like I talked about last week, but, but I'll feel this compulsion to share this good news with other people, even if it means potentially offending them as I try to explain to them their need for it. I'll feel this compulsion to share it with them. Now, point of clarification, can I make people receive the gospel? No. No, I can't. People can still reject the gospel. And many will. Many will. In fact, on that point, I'm reminded of the story this week of George Wilson, who in 1830 was found guilty of many crimes and sentenced to be hanged. However, George Wilson had some friends with influence who pleaded for mercy on his behalf to the President of the United States of America. And after President Andrew Jackson heard their plea, he offered Wilson a formal pardon. Shockingly, though, Wilson refused the pardon, which then created a lot of confusion uh, because some folks thought that Wilson had to receive the pardon since the pardon came from the President of the United States of America. Uh, the case actually went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court where it was determined that George Wilson was in fact not obligated to receive that presidential pardon. He could, by way of his own free will, refuse the pardon. The Chief Justice wrote this. He said, a pardon is an act of grace, but delivery is not completed without acceptance. It may be rejected by the person to whom it is tendered. And we, as a court, have no power to force it on him. We have no power to force it on him. When George Wilson was given the letter of pardon from the president, he tore it up. And he said, you hang me now, not because of my crimes, but because I reject your pardon. I reject your pardon. Folks like George Wilson, you and I, we stand guilty before a holy God and before an even higher court because of our many crimes against God and his rule. After all, every one of us has suppressed our knowledge of God in one way or another, at one time or another, to do what we want. But like George Wilson, we too have a friend in Jesus who pleaded with more than words for our pardon. We too have a friend 
in Jesus who willingly gave up his life for our pardon. Dying the death that we deserve so that we might go free if we will but humble ourselves and receive it. But like George Wilson, the pardon must be received. The pardon must be received. See, we can choose to reject God's offer. And if we do, then like Wilson, it will be as if we are saying to God, you condemn me now, not because of my sins, but because I reject your pardon. Friends, don't reject the pardon that God is offering you through Christ. Don't reject God's grace because of your pride, because you, a mere creature, want to play God. If you've never taken this step, humble yourself today before your creator. Acknowledge your sin and your need for the gospel, and then receive what Christ did for you. When he took upon himself, when he took upon himself God's wrath against sin, and then three day, days later rose from the dead to prove that sin and death really were defeated. Friends, God doesn't want you to remain under his wrath. His love for us is so great that Jesus willingly took upon himself God's wrath against us so it wouldn't fall on us. That's how much he loves us. He died the death that you and I deserve so that you and I could be forgiven, so that you and I could be adopted into his family, so that you and I could have this new identity as his beloved children and this new life, this new life that's marked by peace and joy and this hope that we will be heirs in his glorious kingdom that's coming. And so let me just say, if you've never put your trust in Christ, I invite you to do so today. Let Paul's explanation of God's wrath against sin do what it was intended to do. And what it was intended to do is wake us up to our need for a Savior so that we repent and believe the gospel, so that we put our trust in Jesus as our Savior and King. You can do that right now, right where you are. If you've never taken this step, you can do that right where you're sitting during our next song. And then I would also invite you to declare that step on the orange card in the seat back in front of you. And then to drop that card in one of the boxes on your way out so that we can be praying for you as you get connected to the Trinity family, as you can then be able to get in on resources that will help you in this journey of what it means to trust and follow Jesus. I'd also invite you to head to our prayer corner during our final song or right after the service and let someone pray for you. If you're ready to put your trust in Jesus, if you're ready to receive his pardon for sin. And then for those of you who have already put your trust in Jesus, you've already received his pardon from sin, uh, maybe your next step today is to ask God to show you one person that you can share the gospel with this week. Maybe in person, maybe in a letter, maybe over a text to get the conversation started. But ask God, even in these next few moments, moments ask God to, to help you give witness to someone this week as to how he opened your eyes to your sin, how he opened your eyes to your need for a Savior, as this way of pointing them to Jesus, not just as this religious figure who works for you, but as this one we desperately need to save us from our sins. Specifically, ask God to give you an opportunity to give this kind of witness to someone this week. He will. Friends, he loves to answer this prayer. He loves to answer this prayer. In fact, I didn't do this in the first service, but this last weekend I uh, had an opportunity to play a round of golf, and I just showed up because I had an hour to spare, and it's sometimes a way to just, like, relax. And there were a couple of guys who uh, asked, hey, you want to play with us? I didn't want to play with them. <laughs> but I said, yeah, I'd love to. <laughs> they were not followers of Jesus. <laughs> I think they pounded a six-pack six pack before we got the whole six. Um, we're just talking and so what I'm doing is doing what I'm trying to do all the time like create an open door what do you do like how, where have you lived like I'm just trying to ask questions thinking maybe at some point they'll ask me a question <laughs> by the end of whole six they hadn't asked me a question they told me a whole lot uh, <laughs> with about every other word being uh, one of the Mount Rushmore words of expletives and uh, so at the end of whole six I had a moment I just texted a man hey I'll be home in a, you know, a few minutes um I'm praying for these guys. I'm, I'm praying that the Lord will give me an open door. But I don't know if it's coming. That's, I think I actually said that, but I don't know if it's coming. I hit send. Amanda writes back, Lord, open a door. So I say it in text. Amanda says it. 15 seconds later, I'm not exaggerating, one of the guys says, so what do you do? 
30 seconds after that, I'm giving testimony to Christ's forgiveness of my sins and how he's given me a new life. Now they weren't ready to receive that new life, but, but that's not the point of the story. Ask God to give you open doors to be able to be a witness for him and the gospel. He will. I, I invited them to church a couple of times too. If they're, I would notice if they were here. They're not here. Maybe they're watching online. Hey guys, let's go play some golf. I would, let's talk some more about Jesus. That's not the point. The point, we can't make people come to Christ. But our job is to be a witness. So for some of you, that's your next step. Ask God to show you one person that you can share the gospel with this week. It's a dangerous but beautiful prayer because God loves to answer it. He loves to answer it. Worship team is already up here. They're going to lead us in our closing song in just a moment. Again, respond to God's word however you need to respond to God's word. Let's pray. Father, thank you for all that you've done for us in and through Christ. What a deal. Jesus, thank you for absorbing the wrath that was due us. God, we just acknowledge and declare your holiness. You're good, you're perfect, you're righteous. You do not wink at sin. You're going to respond to all moral evil that would destroy us and your creation as a sign, as evidence of your love for us. Thank you that you perfectly demonstrated that in Christ so that your holiness could be upheld and your love and mercy still demonstrated to us. Lord, I pray that you would drill that truth deep into our hearts today. And for anyone here who's never received that good news, I pray by your spirit, make it real to their hearts now. Move them to turn to and trust you. That we might have more and more and more and more and more testimonies like Caitlin's and Max's. Lord, do the work that only you can do and then help us to be so grateful for what you've done that we would look for those opportunities that we would pray for you to open doors and that we would then have the courage to walk through them and then the peace to leave the results up to you. So do that work among us by your spirit and for the glory of King Jesus in whose name we pray and everyone agreed and said, amen. Let's stand, let's worship him now.